All right, welcome. Good morning to your first session of the day. This is the Human Centered Design Approach to RFPs. That's not the session you intended to be at. Now's your chance to exit without hurting my feelings. If you leave after this point, you might hurt my feelings. <laughs> um, so, the agenda. Um, I'll do a quick introduction here in a minute. Um, exercise prep, instead of remind me to say this. We are gonna do like a brainstorming kind of thing in the middle of this. So just if you could have, whether it's a notepad or you know, just have a notepad on a computer open or someplace where you can jot your ideas down for two minutes during brainstorming so you don't forget them all, um, that'll be helpful. Um, we're gonna do a stakeholder identification exercise and also a stakeholder needs exercise around RFPs. Um, then I wanna get into my top six vendor needs, what we wish people writing RFPs knew, um, and then hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A. So a little bit about me. Um, I've been sort of selling web-related stuff for way too long. I've been in the Drupal community now for about 10 years. Um, my primary job has always been on the sales team um, selling government-focused website projects. Um, in the past, I've sort of been a one-man Drupal RFP response team. My current job, I'm more of a, the technical side of it, so we have proposal writers that um, can do some of that work and we have more of a team approach than I've had in the past. Um, I'm also the director of sponsorships for Drupal for Gov, the organization that puts this on. That's a volunteer job. So if you're a sponsor, you may have gotten emails from me some point in the last few months anyway. Um, I live out in Richmond. I'm a dog person, not a cat person. Um, when I'm not working, you'll probably find me out in the woods camping. And I'm a Red Sox fan. Painful. That's been the last couple of years. And a brief commercial interlude just about who we are, Portage Cybertech. We're a Canadian company. Um, that we do Drupal sites as part of our business. But what we also do is um, we have our own CRM system, our own digital signature and signature platform, and our own identity management service catalog solution that we are in the process of combining into one tightly integrated government website platform that you'll be able to buy in more of a SaaS type of approach versus you know, four hundred thousand dollars up front for the project. Um, and we work with you know mostly Canadian companies, but we have worked in the U.S. with the state of New York, the state of Wyoming. Um, University of Oregon, John Jay University, uh, Georgia Tech. So we have, we have a smattering of U.S. customers, and uh, we don't get for the commercials. Um, so one thing about when I think about RFPs, um, it doesn't ever need to be sort of the combative exercise that can sometimes end up being between people writing the RFPs and the people answering them, because for the most part, I really think we all want the same thing, right? Customer, you want on-time, on-site budget launch if it's a, a website project, right? And on the vendor side. We want to deliver exactly the same thing. On time, on budget, everybody wins. Um, if you're the RFP writer, you want multiple good options to choose from. You know, if you send out an RFP for web for group website and your short list for presentations ends up being, you know, Portage Cybertech, um, Promet Source, and um, CTAC, you're not gonna lose. All three of those companies are gonna do a good job, you know, you're in good shape. Obviously on the vendor side you want to be the win one that wins, but frankly I'd rather compete against two sort of not too big companies, but you know, end of the day, we want, we want you to be happy. Um, we both want to get through the, the procurement process trouble free without protest and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, we all want fair prices. Government, obviously, over the last whatever years, has sort of gotten away, especially on services, from just picking the lowest cost. You know, it's always a component, but you know, being low cost does not guarantee you're going to win website project, and that's a good thing. Um, and hopefully you guys want your vendors to be happy and successful so they can continue to provide services. And we definitely want our customers to be happy and successful so they keep calling us back. So more or less, we're all sort of going the same direction here. Um, so let's take a step back and talk about what is human-centered design, just in case that's not a term you're not really familiar with. Um, so we'll start with defining design. And design is simply the act of creating something new to solve a problem to put it down in the fewest words possible. Um, so human-centered design is simply the, that act, the act of designing something new to solve a problem where up front you spend time with the users of the product or service you're designing to understand what their needs really are so you design to those needs. Um, you know, back in 1910 or whenever, if you'd gone out and asked people, this is Henry Ford's story, you know, he would have said people would tell him they wanted a faster horse. What they wanted was faster transportation, right? They, did, they couldn't conceive of anything other than a horse doing it. Um, what he delivered, the problem he solved with the car was faster and more convenient transportation. 
Whereas people would have said they want a faster course. And you have to do the work up front to understand the need, not just sort of take people to face value sometime. Um, now, did, you know, did anybody fly here for this conference? Okay, I assume you didn't fly first class, right? <laughs> um, is there anything about the coach flying experience that leads you to believe the people designing that process were really concerned about your needs? <laughs> right? No. It was how many bodies can we stuff in the plane to maximize our per seat yield is what they really are trying to do there, right? That's not user-centered or human-centered design at all. Um, I learned this under the phrase human-centered design. You also heard user-centered design. You'll hear design thinking. It's all more or less the same thing. It's a sort of focus up front on defining the user's problems you're solving with the product or service that you're, you're designing there. So, so why do we do this? A lot of website RFPs from the government do actually have a human-centered design component, even if they don't ever use that phrase. You know, they'll want us to, to survey internal stakeholders. They'll want us to survey constituents and talk to external stakeholders and, and sort of get some understanding of what people's problems are with the website or the system before we start building anything. That's essentially human-centered design. Um, and, and what you get out of this when you do it is you get the obvious, the understanding of the needs of your users. You get an alignment among your internal stakeholders. You get everybody involved early. There's no, you reduce the chances that as you get close to building something, um, the finance department puts up a red flag because they don't feel like their needs were heard because they weren't part of the process, which in a big organization can happen, right? So you get all those people involved up front, you eliminate that problem. And ultimately, what you're doing is reducing risk because if you're designing users' needs, you should have a product that'll work in the end. When you reduce risk, you reduce cost, and you get a better outcome. Um, and the whole point of this session here is that I think if we thought about some of this stuff when we're writing RFPs, you would get these exact same benefits. The, the, there'd be less risk that the, the project's going to fail um, in the end, you know, that, or that you're going to get bad, you know, bad responses to your RFP and you don't have to cancel it and redo it, or you pick one that maybe doesn't end up working. Um, if you spend some time up front thinking about what do the users of the RFP, which are both internal and external, really need. <coughs> so, um, I have in the past done a 45 minute session, session just on human centered design at this conference. Today we're going to do it in one slide in about 30 seconds. Um, and really what you're doing here is, is you're identifying your stakeholders, you're identifying your needs. Then you have to prioritize them. Um, that's a step that people sometimes have trouble with. And that's how you get websites that have 185 links off the homepage to every single department in the organization. Mm -hmm. Because they couldn't prioritize, you know, they didn't know what the users needed, so everybody was equal. All information was equal. Um, then you're going to do a strength, weakness, opportunity um, type of analysis of your current system or website. Um, then you're going to group or relate all your challenges that come out of this process so that, you know, okay, these are, you know, user-facing problems. These are the problems that my internal content editors are having with the system and so forth. Um, and then you're going to prioritize the solutions. And, the, and in sort of in the agile software development world, the prioritized solutions, that's essentially your, your backlog to build a website. These are the things we have to fix or build to make the system better. So, I started thinking, how much time do we really spend thinking about who the stakeholders are in an RFP process? And their stakeholders internal to, you know, your government agency or organization, and there's, you know, the vendor side of the stakeholders too. So I thought it would be fun, at least I think it's fun, maybe you guys won't, <laughs> to take two minutes and do a brainstorming exercise, and just we get a piece of paper, open up notebook on, you know, open up, you know, notepad and notebook, whatever you want to do, um, and we'll just take two minutes and just write down, you know, without thinking too hard, every stakeholder you can think of in the RFP process. And, and, and if you're if you work for an agency, government agency, and you want to just focus on your internal stakeholders because it's easier, that's cool. The vendor side, if you all want to um, think about, you know, your stakeholders and your organization that are trying to respond to the RFP, that's fine. If you want to try to think of the wrong, the other side of the equation and be creative, that's cool. Just write for two minutes. It's brainstorming. There are no wrong answers. And we can, let me get my watch going here. We will start. Now, okay.
20 seconds left. Take a couple minutes and just sort of see what we came up with. Who wants to go first? <laughs> so, I'm a, so I'm a stakeholder. And users of the work. Okay. How about the laws of the land? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Agency leadership. Yep. You're talking government agency, right? Yeah. I mean, honestly, the, agent, the government, you know, the web agency leadership too is a stakeholder, right? Because, you know, <laughs> they're involved. <laughs> I came up with like 20, so I'm sure there's more here. <laughs> but the, the product owner of the owner yep, product. absolutely the business user or the product owner, depending on the term you want to use. What about the actual citizens that will be using the product. Hundred percent, probably the most important stakeholder, I would think, in, mo in most cases. The clients by management team. Yep. Editorial. Yep. IT. Yep. Yeah. By the way, I just realized I forgot to ask earlier. Show of hands, who's so, who's on sort of the vendor I respond to RFPs side of the world, and who's on the I write RFP side of the world. Awesome. I was so hoping I got a few people here <laughs> that actually wrote RFPs for a living. Um, so this is what I came up with on internal, sort of on the government agency side. You know, your content creators, your content editors, people that have to use your website to produce content every day. Um, the IT team, um, right? Your your security officer and his his or her team. Um, your digital marketing people, if, if, if you're doing that kind of stuff. The procurement and legal folks obviously have a stake in all this. Um, your internal developers and designers, if it's a situation where you're not outsourcing everything and you have that kind of staff in the agency to work. Um, you know, the executive product sponsor, marketing, if it's more of a nonprofit approach, public communications team. There's a lot, right? And over on the vendor side, same thing. You got your proposal team that's got to write the proposal. Um, you got the software developers, the you know, Drupal developers on the vendor side. You get the designers that have to design the website. Um, you got your vendor executive team, vendor legal, the constituents, you know, of, of a town or city or, or whoever was doing it. Elected officials often have a stake in it. You know, community activists, if it's the kind of thing where you're solving some problem, where it's like a community focus on, on being involved. Um, so the point being that there are a lot of, um, of stakeholders when you're putting out an RFP. In this case, for Drupal website, but really for anything, you're going to really have all these same types of stakeholders on any 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 project you're working on. Okay, so something we do in, in the agile software development world is we talk about user need statements, and there's three components: a user, a need, <laughs> and a goal. So in, in my example here, Chris, the presenter, needs you all to participate. We don't have to talk for 45 minutes, right? Um, you know, um, the, you know, a citizen needs to, you know, pay their utility bill, and they want to do it online, right? So there's, there's, the, you know, the constituent, the need, so they don't, their bill's not late. They don't want to use postal service. So, um, what I want to do next then is take two more minutes, and it might be easier now, you know, if you just think of yourself or one sort of user, um, and maybe instead of trying to think about all those different categories we had on the previous slide, we just sort of think of it in terms of. The customer side and the vendor side, um, you know, I as a customer need X because Y. And let's take two minutes and write a few of those each too. I timed that perfectly because it's right on the zero zero on seconds. <laughs>
got 30 seconds left. need better UX or human centered design yeah. to increase usability and engagement with X. Yep, 100%. The client's marketing team needs a website that's easy to update regardless of technical skill. 100%. Anybody else want to throw one out? No pressure. There's no wrong answers here. If the client needs a user website survey in order to accomplish capturing CX data or positive and negatives. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Legal needs uh, an MSA in order to accomplish compliance. Yep. That. A digital agency needs a budget range in order to provide a responsible response. And I did not plant that one at all. <laughs> Just so you all know. <laughs> but 100% yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, 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 that's kind of what I'm trying to do here is, you know, we don't necessarily ask for things like budget just because we want to try to maximize it. There's an actual business reason, you know, a need we need to help help do our jobs better when we ask for things like budgets and timelines and all this. Um, so then I thought I would do here. I was going to do this at a top 10 list, but it ended up being top six. Um, and my wife was looking over my shoulder when I was working on this, and she said, Chris, are people gonna know who that is? <laughs> said, are you saying my cultural references are a little bit dated, dear? <laughs> so do I need to explain this to anybody first? Everybody know who Dave Letterman is with the blue card? <laughs> yes. Okay, awesome. I need to explain it or I don't? <laughs> we all know. Okay, all right, good. Because I was gonna feel really old when I try to explain Dave Letterman to people. <laughs> um, so what I did then, I was gonna do a top 10 list as the play on his list, and I ended up only kind of getting six because they, they were repetitive, so I grouped them together. Um, so number one, as a vendor, I need to quickly assess the relevance of multiple RFPs every day to ensure we focus our limited time and resources on the opportunities we can successfully meet, right? So how can, how can you know, the people making the RFPs help us meet this need? Make it searchable. If you get nothing else out of the session, please never again send out an RFP that's not OCR readable. Beyond, it makes it really hard to work with, it's got to be an ADA violation. Because it's a government document that's completely useless to someone this site impaired. Because the, you know, the, the machine's not going to be able to read it to them. Um, and you'd be shocked how often we get RFPs that are essentially pictures of the document that we can't you know, search for words in and can't really work with. Um, you know, the, the big one, the budget. And I understand that sometimes you just, you know, there's legal policy and maybe even laws in some cases to say you can't get budget information. And, I mean, I think those are bad ideas, but again, I don't want anyone to go to jail over this either. And, and reality is, as the vendor is building the website, like, I'm not worried about if your budget's $250,000 or $300,000 so I can maximize it. What I'm worried about is the budget $25,000 or $250,000. Because I can build you a Camry or a Ferrari, I just need to know which one you're buying. Because I obviously don't want to send you a 50 page proposal for a Ferrari, which you really wanted with some sensible transportation, right? Um, so, I mean, that's why we're asking. It's not, and I've had people that literally tell me I can't tell you the budget because you'll just maximize the price. It's like, no, nah, it doesn't happen. What really happens is someone knows your budget, they lowball it a lot, try to win it, and then figure they'll make it up on change orders, which <laughs> is not a win for anyone, right? Um, so, timelines. And where did the timeline come from? I mean, we, we frequently see super complicated website projects that need to be delivered 90 days. Now, is that because the people writing the RFP aren't technical and that seems like a long time to build a website? Or is it because you got a major program initiative launching on March 1st and the website needs to be out for it? Because, you know, those are two separate problems to solve, right? I mean, if it's, they didn't understand, we can tell you this is really a nine month project. In most cases, oh, okay, we didn't, we didn't know that. But obviously, if there's a program launching on March 1st and the website's got to be done on March 1st, well, then maybe the solution there we propose is it needs to be a simpler website so we can get something out there on March 1st and iterate. So again, we're trying to solve problems here. Um, 
technology or platform requirements. And again, I, I, again, I know that you don't want to exclude people and potentially lead to protests, so you don't always want to say, we want Drupal, or we don't want Drupal, whatever the case may be. But again, from the vendor standpoint, I don't want to spend 16, 20 hours writing a Drupal proposal for someone who's dead set on buying Sitecore. You know, so just tell us. <laughs> you know, it won't hurt our feelings. Some people may try to convince you otherwise still, that's fine. But, you know, but, uh, yeah, I guess what I'm saying is, is when, when government people tell me we've done no research and don't know what we want, I don't believe you, <laughs> quite frankly. You know, it's like, no, you guys have some idea what you want or what you don't want. I mean, if you're on Drupal 7 and absolutely hate it and you want to go to WordPress, just say that in RP or, you know, word it as, We've been on Drupal for a long time, and we're, we're not sure it's the best platform for our future. If you know, mm -hmm. Legal won't let you say n no Drupal. We can read between the lines and always have to do it. That's part of, a big part of the job, quite frankly, reading RFPs. So you know, give us the hints we need if you can't tell us outright that you don't want Drupal or you want WordPress or whatever the case may be. Um, and then also, if there are any non-negotiable requirements, really call those out. And that's actually leading into my next slide, so I'm going to flip it over before I do that one. Um, the vendor. I need to understand all the non-negotiable requirements, again, so I don't like give you a proposal you're just going to throw out after you spend an hour reading it because, you know, in my case, I work for a Canadian company, so if non-US companies can't bid, make that obvious. Most of the time, I have to do the Q&A part and ask them, as a Canadian company, can I bid on this? Because nothing in the 120-page RFP says, you know, we have to have US citizens working on this project or we have to have a US-based company working on this project. Um, so you know, again, just make it clear. Um, also, and this is kind of a joke one here, read your boilerplate once in a while and update it. In the last two years, I have read a website RFP, and I won't call out the state it came from, um, that said it, a hard requirement in this project was that at the end, we were to submit their website to the following search engines. Excite, InfoSeek, Ask Jeeves, AltaVista, and about three others that have not been in existence since about 2005. You know, so it's just again, yeah, they took the first our the first website RFP from 2005, renamed it. You know, which is not the worst way to do things, but at least read the boilerplate and make sure it's still relevant. Um, and again, just be super clear about the non-negotiable requirements. If it's important because you're the town of Leesburg, that you know the, the the vendor for this project be in Loudoun County, just put that up front so we know. Okay, as a vendor, I need to understand the background so that I can help solve the problems. Um, don't assume we understand the background. You know, think like a reporter, who, what, when, why. You know, when did we do the website last? Why are we redesigning it now? What's gone wrong or gone right that's made us want to do this project? Um, just kind of give us those background details because we don't know them. Um, and they help us, again, understand your frame of mind, what problems you're trying to solve, and they help us produce, produce better solutions. Um, also, who's the, who's the existing agency? Yeah. Yeah, because it's public record for a for government entity, so you, know, you can tell us, or you can make us spend two hours trying to find it somewhere on, on a federal website. Um, towns and cities are famous for having their tourism department, right? These wonderful eight-page backgrounders at the front of the RFP, which make you want to visit your town or city, but don't help us write the proposal for the website at all. Um, so you can think about the stuff we need to know to, to, to build your new website. Why, does, why, is the new one, why is the old one bad? You know, what do you want to do better this time? Um, again, as a vendor, I always need to ask questions because I always need more detail than the RFP provides. Um, you will get five times the questions you're expecting. Just count on it. Um, I personally send in 20 to 40 questions on any RFP we're seriously considering going after in most cases. Uh, so multiply that by you know, 15, 20 vendors, and you're going to get hundreds of questions incoming. Um, you will not answer them all in one day. Um, I can't tell you how often we see Vendor questions due October 31st, 5 p.m. You know, client answers to be published November 1st, 5 p.m. But no, you're not. <laughs> not gonna happen. Um, you know, you only need one day just to collate the questions and group them. You know, so you're not answering the same budget question nine times. You can just answer one budget question and be, and be responsive for all of them. Um, again, provide detailed answers. Um, I'll, okay, I'll admit I'm sure there are agencies because I kind of see the same questions you do sometimes. Um, that clearly they didn't read the RFP. And I don't like those people any more than you guys do, <laughs> okay? But for mo most of the vendors are reading the RFP at least twice, and these are still the questions we have. So, you know, um, give us some detail in our answers, please. Um, and also, we are judging your answers. One of the things, one of the ways I can tell if this is a sort of recompete for the vendor and the incumbent's pretty much gonna win it, just you know, legal's making you send out another RFP, because it's been five years, or you really are looking for new ideas, 
is the quality of your Q&A. If I get a bunch of one-line answers in the q and I'm like, yeah, they don't really care if they get good proposals. You know, their incumbents got this one locked up, which, man, that's how it works. I understand that. No big deal. I'm fine with knowing that. I just don't want to, again, do all the work to find it out. Um, and, but, but if I get back, you know, these nice paragraph chunky answers, really providing the additional insight I'm looking for, I'm like, oh, these guys really are looking for help. They really want, some, they really want to get good proposals and have a successful project. Um, and those are the ones that are a lot more fun to work on from the vendor side. You know, those, are, those are the clients we want. And then as a vendor, I need enough details to accurately estimate the LOE so that I can provide the best possible solution. Um, I could honestly do 45 minutes on this slide. Maybe I'll do a future presentation. But start thinking about the three biggest, to me, the, the three biggest danger areas where website projects go way off the rails mm -hmm. are design, migration, and integrations. So if nothing else when you're writing these, try to make sure you overshare those three bullet points. Um, design, you know, we, we, we look at the project and think, okay, they're gonna need 12, 12 or 13 wireframes, 12 or 13, you know, mock-ups to build the site. And then the client was expecting an, a detailed mock-up of every web form in the project. You know, those are two very, that's a lot extra work that may not have been accounted for in our estimate or the budget or whatever. Um, same thing with migrations. Um, you know, if you get, if you got a website that's been around 10 years and it's got, you know, 20,000 pages and 33,000 PDFs in it, um, moving that to any new CMS, whether it's Drupal 7 to 10 or WordPress to Drupal or whatever, is going to be a huge, huge amount of work. And it's a huge risk factor on the vendor side to underestimate that piece. Um, and, then, and in the same way, we don't want to end up overestimating by four times and make our project be ridiculously priced high because we weren't sure how complicated the migration was going to be. So, you know, try to give us the information we asked for there. The same thing with integrations. You know, so often we see, we ask like, okay, you mentioned there's some back-end HRS system that integrates with the website, can you give us some details? And they'll say, we'll be provided to the winning vendor. Well, too late. <laughs> we can't, how do, how do, is, it, is, it, is it a simple REST API call that we can do in a day? Or are we gonna have to build a new API that takes 150, 200 hours? I mean, it could be either one, and we have no idea at that point. Um, that's why we ask the questions in the Q&A about the integrations. So really, you know, overshare to the extent you can, please, because the more information we have, the better, um, the better proposal we can give you, and more accurate proposal we can give you. And the reality is, quite frankly, and I realize most projects are fixed costs. The only thing I, I know about my fixed cost price is it's wrong. I just hope it's not wrong by much. <laughs> it's, because it really, there's no way you can take a two thousand dollar project and really estimate it, you know, to a dollar, um, you know, from a from a fifty page RFP. It just that's not possible. Um, and again, I could do 45 minutes on why you shouldn't do fixed cost bids, but again, different subject. Um, and I think this is my last one. Yeah, as a vendor, I need to understand the decision process um, so I can produce a proposal tailored to your priorities. Um, you know, if it's a very technical team evaluating proposals, that changes how I write the proposal versus if it's like the marketing comms people making the decision. Um, I will overshare on technical stuff, obviously, for the, the nerds. Whereas I'll back off that in the proposal. It's more of a communications focus to you. Um, so, you know, please, and, and get, generally, government's pretty good about this these days, about you know, giving us a decision grid, and it's 30%, you know, your process, 20% resumes, and so forth and so on. Um, because I, mean, I, I literally will tape that up in front of my laptop, you know, or have it in a tab to remind myself when writing proposals. This, these are the four things that are really important to the customer in this, in this RFP. Make sure everything I'm writing I can relate back to the four things you told me are important. Again, I want, I want to give you a proposal that you love. Um, and then you can sort of get the same thing, just, you know, tell us who they're viewing it. And then not by, I don't need names, I just need to know again if it's, you know, the CTO is the main decision maker versus the, you know, the director of communications, because that's two very different proposals most of the time. Um, so, for, for those of you on the government side thinking, what about my needs? I would love to see somebody from the government side next year essentially do this presentation from your point of view. It'd be awesome. If you wanted to collaborate and make it like a joint thing, feel free to email me. I'd love to do that with you. Um, so yeah, I'm not ignoring the customer needs here at all. I just, I don't honestly know them from that point of view because I'm not on that side of the, of the process. Um, we would absolutely love um, to see that kind of presentation so that we understand some of the decisions you're making in the RFP that make us scratch our heads sometimes. And to summarize, essentially help us help you. Again, we're all, I think we're all on the same side here. Um, so give us the basics up front to the extent you can legally. Um, you can share that background, think like a reporter, why, who, what, and when about the project so we understand why you're doing this. 
Um, make the requirements easy to find. Um, literally, if you've got a bunch of boilerplate, and we, we know everybody does, put that in the appendix, or put make appendix A the you know the project requirements. Just sort of separate them so that they're not sort of all jumbled together. Um, there's a famous story. I'm going to get really old school here from the 1970s about the rock band Van Halen. They would in their um, in their contracts for their concerts put a requirement like buried on page 40 in a small type that in the dressing room they wanted a jar of M&Ms with the brown M&Ms removed. And it wasn't that anybody in the band was like had a phobia about brown M&Ms, but if they walked in and saw that, they believed that told them someone read the proposal, you know, the, the writer closely and were being careful. But I've always thought that was a bad approach to it because their lead singer literally swing across the stage on a, on a hook, you know, David Lee Roth. And like, I was more, I'd be more worried about, did they double check that thing? <laughs> you know, not that someone who should have been working on safety was spent three hours separating brown M&Ms out of the bag of M&Ms from the, from the candy counter, right? Um, so, you know, just make the requirements obvious, basically. Um, expect lots of questions. You can never, ever provide too much detail in RFP. I'd much rather have too much detail than enough. Um, and sort of tell us how you're making the decision so we can scale things and scope things the way you want to see it. And we're doing this in 30 minutes in the hotel this morning. I did it in 33 here. It's not bad. Um, and I wanted to leave like a good 15 minutes for, for questions so you're going to have sort of both the RFP readers and the RFP writers in the same room. Yes? I have a question for some of the RFP writers. Um, going back to the background, what are some of the reasons or maybe some of the things I guess preventing roadblocks that you're having and sharing all of the background. Is it really that you're not doing uh, sort of the research? I have heard that before. Is it more than that? Is it like legal challenges? Would love to dive deeper into what some of those reasons are. That's a question for somebody from the government side if they want to volunteer an answer. <laughs> Let me repeat it first just to make sure the recording pick it up. The question was basically, what are the sort of the roadblocks that keep you from sharing more of the background information about you know, the current vendor, the history of the project, so forth, that, we, that we'd like to see in RFPs but frequently don't? Is there anybody from the RFP writing side willing to? So I can take a crack at that. Awesome. Um, from the uh, federal side, but having come from uh, the vendor side for many years, I'm not getting ready to date myself, but I'm not dating myself. But uh, having moved into the federal side, there's a lot of inexperience in the background of other projects. Sometimes there's turnover on teams, especially technical teams. Um, there's a lot of dependency on the vendor that sits in-house to help with the tech that the uh, customers just may not dive into and just may not know the backstory behind. So that's where you get, you know, you're pulling out RFPs from 2005. Oh, this works. It looks accurate. Yeah. Um, but I can say that uh, sometimes, hmm, and you can't speak for everyone, but sometimes I find that the customer or client who's now just doesn't understand the project. Um, and so they've done the research, like you say. Um, they they know the you know they know what's hot out there they know what's trending but they don't really understand the requirements and how it will apply to their need um, and so I find that uh, they'll just avoid going into the backstory um, and then you know at the end of the day another reason I would say is there's just that red tape um, sometimes I feel like there's a little secrecy um, that. Uh, I'd say maybe many customers just don't feel as though they need to expose, mm -hmm. especially if there's flaws. Um, it can get a little tricky when it comes to uh, putting everything out there and then now you've got this RFP out there, you've got a winner, and now you've got some appeals, you know, because of what was shared that may not have needed to have been shared, that the person writing the RFP with acquisitions wasn't clear on or yeah so it, it, it can get a little murky on the client side in my experience. <laughs> I've seen some worst case scenarios too where you know the RFP will go out and then there'll be a round of questions and answers mm -hmm. and then you get like an overwhelming amount of questions mm -hmm. and then you have to write answers to all of those but what happens is you issue 
an amendment to the RFP, sometimes mm -hmm. multiple amendments yes. to the RFP. So to go back. Make that clear. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I've seen like cases of like three, four amendments mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Push the due date back, push the time, the whole timeline yeah. back. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll, I've been shocked at how often I'll ask something like, you know, so you, you want hosting? How much traffic did your website get? And they'll tell me in the Q and A, we don't have access. We don't have access to our own Google Analytics because maybe the vendor controlled the account or something. They literally. Which I get, that's a different problem, right? Making sure that you're not sort of locked in by your vendors that way. But yeah, they, sometimes they literally just don't know. And you've got customers yeah. who don't know that they would need to know. Because right. they know the vendor handles that. You know, um, they'll just feed us the reports, which will push up to senior leadership. Um, so yeah, it's, it can get a little murky. And, and they don't know what they don't know. Right. You know? So there come the questions and the amendments. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Anybody else? Anything you want to offer up? The one thing I'll give you back off that to say a lot of our customers have told me that they don't even are involved in the RFP writing process. Yes. They'll write the statement of objectives in SMW, they'll hand it to a procurement, and it goes into a black box. Yep. And so you can tell as a vendor when that happens, but that happens a lot. Where as the government, it's important to put that in the statement of objectives or SAL because you don't, it might not make its way into the RFP. They don't, if it's LPTA or not, that's not based on the decision maker, it's based on procurement deciding if it's going to go 8A, it's going right. to go LPTA, it's going to go small business. It kind of doesn't always, they all often don't have power at all to inform that process. Anybody else? Going once, going twice, go get coffee. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.